Thank you for listening to our midweek service from Christian Ministry Church. We're praying that this message blesses, encourages, and equips you to build the kingdom of God. And now a message from Pastor Paul Kern. After that prayer, I don't even need to preach. But I'm going to. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, and I'm going to pick up where Josh left off. So we're going to be uh, verse 19 all the way through chapter 7, verse 27. So that's going to be what I'm going to attempt anyway, and we'll see what happens. <clears throat> but we're looking at the words of Jesus. We're looking at the red letters. We're getting wisdom from the master himself. So we'll start out reading here, Matthew 6, verse 19. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them, where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves don't break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be. Boy, that's a, huh, that's a statement. Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. That's another big statement. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one, love the other, you'll be devoted to one, and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. And that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. So worry is like, it's a catalyst that moves you into the love of money. Okay. Don't worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food to eat or drink, enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food in your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant. They don't harvest. They don't store food in barns for your heavenly Father feeds them, and I feed them a lot. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work to make their clothing, yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And God cares so wonderfully for the flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow. He will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry. Everybody say, don't worry. Let's just say that one more time. Just one more for good measure. Look at your neighbor and say, don't worry. There you go. He says, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live right, and God's going to give you everything you need. Wow, that's simple. That's just not hard at all. Verse 34, so don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. <clears throat> So let's talk about this. Let's unpack this a little bit. Um, I think humans are naturally thing-oriented, stuff-oriented. I, I, I think all of us are. I think we are strongly inclined to get wrapped up in seeking, acquiring, and enjoying material possessions. I think all of us are, especially Westerners, right, because we're so blessed. I mean, look at the world we live in. Look at our culture. Look at all that we have. I mean, Pastor Tim's preached about this before. You know, we don't, we don't get in a covered wagon and go to town. We get in an air-conditioned car with air-conditioned seats and cruise control and all, all of these just incredible amenities that we have. So I think because we live in the Western culture and the prosperity that we've enjoyed, we tend to build our lives around that prosperity, right? And so it's a lot easier for us to become thing-focused, acquiring, oriented, getting, because there's so many things available to us that we can acquire, seek, and get. And um, I, th I think also, you know, we have to remember we have a fallen nature when it comes to acquiring things and being materialistic. And I, th I think because of our fallen nature, 
we've even perverted the scripture in the West, and we've, you know, we got caught up in the prosperity message for a very long time. It started out really pretty pure, but over time it got corrupted, and we fell into this, you know, years and years of, pro of the prosperity gospel, and um, not, and, and I'm, I'm going to try to develop this a little bit, but, the, but the, the prosperity gospel became very popular in the United States, right? Obviously, that's something we're all aware of, and it still is in, in a lot of pockets. But, but the West wasn't the first culture to come up with a prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel was around when Jesus was here. The Pharisees preached the go a prosperity gospel. I mean, th they themselves... As a matter of fact, in Luke chapter 16, verse 14, it says the Pharisees were called lovers of money. And it's just so important. And I, this is why I like why we have midweek and we break down the Scripture. Th this is important that we do this. I think being at the midweek is almost more important than being at Sunday, honestly, because midweek we unpack things. And one of the reasons that I think it's important to be at midweek is because false doctrine leads to false standards. If you have false doctrine, you'll have false standards. And that's why a lot of people fall into a lot of error because they don't know the Word. And they don't understand what the full, the full revelation of the Word and what's being taught. <clears throat> you know, when Tim and I were younger in the ministry, we saw a lot of televangelists get really weird. I mean, it was a, you know, when, when cable television was really in its, its highlight, there were so many of these prosperity gospel preachers. I mean, they were selling prayer cloths, anointing oil, water from the Jordan River, I mean, all kinds of weird stuff, and making all kinds of money off of it. I mean, I know a prosperity gospel preacher that went to prison for doing all that stuff, got out, and now he's back doing it again. I'm not going to call any names. If you're of my age you'll, or older, you'll know who I'm talking about, but so they, they turn upside down the teachings of the Old Testament blessings and they, they pervert the meaning of the text. Because even when we look like if, if, if you've read through like Numbers and Deuteronomy, right? And God's talking about going into the promised land and experiencing the blessings that he is going to give them. What a lot of people will do if they don't have an understanding of the text and the and what the gospel is about, they're going to focus on when you enter into the good land and you are what? Blessed coming in and blessed going out. And man, that, that becomes the focus. Because who doesn't want to be blessed? But the, the focus of all of that text, it was not the blessing. The fact is, in the scriptures like Deuteronomy 28, the focus was on obedience to the Lord's command, and then the byproduct of that obedience would be what? Blessing. Live right, experience blessing. That, that, and so it's like God says, look, <clears throat> you know, if you'll live right, it, it, things are going to work out better for you. It's not going to be perfect, but... Life's going to work a lot better for you. You know, I, I, I don't drive down the road in my truck looking in the rearview mirror all the time when a cop's behind me worried about getting pulled over like I used to. Because used to, I'd have 500 ecstasy under my seat. I don't worry about that anymore. I live right. I've been delivered. So I don't have that concern. Proverbs 23, verse 4, it says... And this is for all of us. Don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Cease from your consideration of it. So our focus as believers 
is not waking up every day and how much money can I make. That's not our focus. Now, does God want us to go to work? Yes, 100%. You don't work, you don't. That's a scripture. Does God want us paying our bills? Yes, 100%. But God does not want you getting the cart before the the horse here, right? So I think two forces are most prevalent when it comes to loving money, greed and a lack of faith. I think, though, you know, as I'm thinking this through, I think those are probably the two big things. It's like greedy people and people who lack faith. They, they lack trust in the Lord. So we have to be careful and we have to be aware of these two motivations influencing our view toward money and why we get up every day and go to work or why we invest. There's nothing wrong with investing. The question is, is, is why? So let me balance this. Jesus never preached against wealth, and Jesus never preached against money. You're not going to find it in the Scripture. And, I, you know, I, I've watched people swing to the other ditch of this. I've encountered people like this. I've talked to them. And um, they, they swing to the other ditch, and, um, you know, they basically are advocating poverty. And Jesus never advocated poverty. Here's what we do. We take blessing or wealth or poverty as a means of measuring spirituality. That's not how you measure spirituality. Spirituality. There's only one time that I know of in Scripture that Jesus told someone to sell all their possessions and give them to the poor. Only one guy that I know of, it was a young man, and in that particular case, that young man's wealth was an idol for him. It was a barrier between him and the lordship of Jesus in his life. And and the problem was not his wealth, it was his unwillingness to part with his possessions. That was, you know, because they were his top priority in his life. That young man, his wealth and his money and his possessions was his top priority. And this just provided an excellent test for Jesus to see if the young man was willing to fully commit his life to the Lord and make Jesus the Lord of his life. And clearly he wasn't, and he walked away really sad, the Bible says. Um, You know, once again, remember... It was, it, was, it was God who blessed his people, right? It was God who said, I'm going to take you into the good land. It was God who said, when you get your good houses and you're blessed, don't what? Don't forget me. So it was God's intention and God's heart for his kids to prosper, to be blessed. I don't think God wants anybody to be poor. Abraham was mega rich. Have you read about Abraham and what all he had and what he possessed? This guy had so much money and so many possessions. God blessed his people with possessions, land, livestock, housing, clothing, money, and everything else that they honestly acquired. Honestly, key word. Because that falls under obedience, right? Seek first the kingdom of God and his what? Righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. So God's made many promises of material blessings to his children. And because of God's generosity, he expects us to be generous. He doesn't, he does, God does not expect his disciples to be greedy. That's not the heart of a true disciple. The heart of a true disciple is to be generous. We open up our homes. We are hospitable, the Bible says. We give. We bless. We help. And God blesses us because of that. And and God, actually, he commands us not only to be givers, he commands us to be joyful givers, and he commands us to be thankful givers. Amen? Amen. Um, another scripture is um, 1 Timothy chapter 6, 
If you, if you want to turn there, you can. I'll wait on you. Go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. 1 Timothy 6, 17. It says, Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money. Motive, right there. Which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who, what? Rich, look at this, richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Oh, Paul's preaching that prosperity gospel. No, I'm not. That's not what I'm preaching. I'm preaching live righteous, live honestly, obey God, put him first, and then guess what? The heart of the Father God wants to bless his kids. Jo I had Josh's son Micah work with me today. Josh, he knocked it out, man. Micah helped me put together some benches, and then, and man, this guy, I mean, he worked up. I'm talking, he worked an Allen wrench, a Phillips head screwdriver, a crescent wrench, like, at 11 years old, like a pro. I mean, I was really impressed. Because you got to learn that hand-eye coordination, right? So, it's so important. But anyway, we worked on some benches, and then we repaired some other benches, and then we, we took them down, and we delivered them. And, and um, when we got done, he said, man, I don't need to work out today. I got my workout in. And I said, that, that's what you want to accomplish in the heart of a young man. And then I paid him, right? Because I wanted to bless Micah. I wanted to reward him for his efforts, you know, and his good attitude. Didn't complain one time, worked hard, did great, and I wanted to reward him. That's the heart of the Father. That's God's heart toward us. So when we see the red letters and Jesus is teaching us, he's teaching us proper heart motives toward money. Money's not bad. Jesus probably preached more money than he did just about anything. Now, rich people are tempted to trust in their wealth, and poor people are tempted to doubt God's provision. That's the difference, okay? The rich are tempted to become self-satisfied in the false security of their wealth, and the poor, they're tempted to worry and fear in the false security of their lack. Because who is the need meter? Who is Jehovah Jireh? Our Father, right? Not our jobs, not our 401k, for those of you who are retired, not your investments, not your retirement. Obviously, we won't be wise. We want to do all those good things. Nothing wrong with any of that. I love the verse in um, chapter 6, verse 34. It says, don't worry about tomorrow. Just nudge your neighbor one more time so you don't forget that. For tomorrow, will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. You, listen, if you need a recipe for peace, if you need a recipe for the God kind of life, I can't think of a better verse than this. Just trust in the Lord. Don't worry about well, the economy and this and that. Listen, don't worry. Trust in the Lord. Don't worry because it leads to a greedy, prideful, stingy, worry-filled heart. None of those things have anything to do with the fruit of the Spirit. Instead, what do we do? We seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness. We give generously. If anything, when things get tight, you ought to up your, your giving. If anything. Just to show your flesh that you trust in the Lord, and you're not going to allow a bunch of worry and fear to dictate and control your emotions. I do that. Like, I just, I, I take command of myself in certain times. It's like, things are really tight. We don't have a lot of money. It's time to give. I'll give, I'll give my way out of this quick. And that's not prosperity. It says the farmer who sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and the farmer who sows generously will reap generously. And, and it says God produces a bounty of 30, 60, and 100 fold. So that's, all that is, is, is biblical teaching. All right, let's move on. Uh, Matthew 7, verse 1 through 6, Do not judge others, you will not be judged, for you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. 
Why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? Ouch. (laughs) How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Don't throw your pearls before pigs. They'll trample pearls, and then they'll attack you. So this is a classic portrayal of self-righteous judgment. And this is what the Pharisees and the tax collectors would do. They had a self-righteous judgment. Um, I think a great example of this is in Luke 18, you know, when um, the publican and the Pharisee went to the temple to pray. Y'all remember that one? I'm not going to go through it, but you can, you can look it up there in Luke 18, 10. But, you know, one's, the, you know, the publican, he's just humbled and he won't even look up to heaven and he's beating his chest and God forgive me. And then, you know, the Pharisee's like, I'm glad I'm not like that guy. <laughs> you know, that, that was their attitude. And and listen, you can just know, when anyone elevates themselves, someone is going to be lowered every time. So if you catch yourself getting self-righteous and looking down your nose at someone who's doing something they shouldn't be doing, be careful. You better be very, very careful. The Pharisees were doing all they could to lift themselves in their own eyes, including acting like they were spiritual judges in condemning other people. That's what they were doing. And here's the problem that we've encountered with this verse, okay? Once again, we go to the other ditch. This is what we do. We just overcompensate all the time. It's just hard, it's just hard for us to stay between the lines, right? The white stripe and the yellow stripe. We just have a hard time staying in between them. We're going to go whoa, whoa, back and forth. <clears throat> This passage has been used to suggest that believers should never evaluate or criticize anybody for anything. This scripture has been used for that. Our culture hates, especially theological or moral absolutes, our culture hates it. They don't want theological or moral absolutes. And, and, and this, this simplistic interpretation like, you know, don't criticize anybody, all-inclusive, compromising, unity at all costs, fellowship at all costs. That simplistic interpretation of this scripture provides an easy way to escape confrontation. That's all, I mean, really, that's all we're doing. Because today, you know, we have a lot of, and, and a lot of pastors that know better, preaching this all-inclusive love, compromise, unity, which has got all of those things. Yes, he is. But to the modern religious person, those are the only doctrines worth defending now. And any doctrine, any, any, any doctrine that conflicts with that doctrine, the doctrine of unity and fellowship and Inclusiveness, it's going to get sacrificed to that. And once again, that's just, this is why the midweek is so important. Because we, we learn about Jesus and what Jesus actually taught. <clears throat> I, you know, they want to eliminate anything divisive, any, anything that's divisive in Scripture, it needs to be eliminated. And the higher goal of unity and fellowship is what we all need to go after. This is, I mean, this just happened. I mean, this, big move in, in uh, I'm not going to mention the not denomination, but huge denomination made a huge move toward this right here. <clears throat> and, but the problem is, see, only with right doctrine, biblical doctrine, can we even know what true holiness is, what true fellowship is, what true unity is. You can't know what it actually looks like without knowing true doctrine, studying the Word fully. See, it's important to understand that spirit... Uh, just think about this. Spiritual reformation that has ever happened in the church has never occurred apart from confrontation, ever. 
I mean, think about the 16th century Reformation that took place. I mean, it was incredible. I mean, God did some amazing things in his church. And I, I, I mean, those men and women of God that were involved in that Reformation, I mean, it never would have happened apart from the strong conviction and confrontation that they brought. I mean, think about God's prophets. Think about all the prophets. What were they? These guys were confrontational people. They were judging people's behavior. They were judging people's motives. They were judging what people were doing. So Jesus is not saying, don't ever judge. Jesus is saying, don't judge unrighteously. Don't judge hypocritically. We, we also see when it comes to judging right and wrong that Jesus himself, never, he, Jesus never forbid the law of Moses. He never said, I came to abolish the law. What did he say? I came to fulfill the law. And he said, and, and he said I'm, I'm not going to stop until every last little bit of it is fulfilled. That was what Jesus taught. The greatest sermon that Jesus ever taught was the Sermon on the Mount. And obviously, this is what we're going through right now. And he was teaching his disciples to be discerning and perceptive in what they believed and what they did. That's what Jesus was teaching through the Sermon on the Mount. So if anything, you know, we have to understand, we, we, Jesus was teaching his disciples to make every effort to discern, through what is, to discern through what is a falsehood and what is truth, what is, what is an, an internal value, and what is an external value, what is true and false religion, right? In short, between God's way and all other ways. So it had every, it, I mean, the whole thing is about judging. A few verses later in Matthew 7, verse 15, Jesus warns, he says, beware of the false prophets. Jesus called people false prophets. You're wrong, you're right. You judge me? Yes, I am. 100%. Hebrews 5.14, solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right behavior and wrong behavior. Amen? 2 John 10.11, uh, if anyone comes to your meeting and does not teach the truth about Christ, don't invite that person into your home or give them any kind of encouragement. What about all this inclusiveness and all this unity and all this fellowship? Don't let them in your house. Anyone who encourages such people becomes partners in their evil work. This is what the Word says. So Jesus is talking about the self-righteous, egotistical judgment and the unmerciful condemnation of others that was practiced by the religious leaders of the day. And we just have to be real careful that that's not what we become. We love people. We love people in their sin, through their sin, and out of their sin, and into the kingdom, right? That's what we do. I tell our interns all the time, and I'll tell you guys this, if you knew all the stuff that I had done, if you knew all the detail, if I just stood up here and like cracked open my dirty laundry hamper and just started exposing all the stuff that I've done, you wouldn't sit here and listen to me. But if I knew all the stuff you'd done, I wouldn't sit here and talk to you. <laughs> right? And so we all lean into what? Grace and forgiveness. So Jesus is just saying, look, watch your heart motivation. When you judge others, don't look down your nose at them. Recognize you're not perfect either, and let that guide your approach to their sin. One of the verses that really sticks out to me, and I'm going to end, this, end the, the whole judging thing with this, in Luke chapter 19, verse 41 and 42, it says, as Jesus approached Jerusalem for the last time, he saw the city and he wept over those who refused to recognize him as king. And I think we should be like Jesus. We should be very sorrowful for those who don't repent. Josh preached about this Sunday. We should avoid wrong judgment. 
I think we need, especially to avoid wrong judgment, and our heart needs to be to accomplish right discernment, not judgmental or critical discernment, but right discernment. I think that's the mark of a kingdom citizen. Then the last half, and we don't have time to go through all this, but Jesus just gives more teaching on right living. He talks about prayer. He talks about persevering in prayer, not giving up in prayer. Don't just pray one prayer and you quit. Well, it wasn't meant to be. No, ask, seek, knock, ask, and keep asking, knock, and keep knocking, seek, and keep seeking. And um, so a lot about persevering prayer. Talks about the golden rule, you know, do to others whatever you'd like them to do to you. That's the essence of all that was taught in the law and the prophets. He talks about the narrow gate. In the wide gate, he talks about a tree and its fruit. Once again, he gets right back into judging because he's talking about, okay, here's how you discern whether somebody is a true Christian or they're not a true Christian. And then, so he talks about true disciples. And then I want to end on this part, building on a, on a solid foundation. Verse 24 of chapter 7, if you want to look at that with me, and we'll, we'll spend two minutes here because I'm out of time. Anyone who listens to my teaching follows it as wise, like a person who builds a house on a solid rock. The rain comes and the torrents and the floodwaters rise and beats against that house, and it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears these teaching and doesn't obey is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse and it will have a mighty crash. In these passages, passages, Jesus is teaching the importance of what you build your life on. It's all about what you build on. Um, I think... I think it's important to recognize the difference in the two builders was not noticeable on the outside. It wasn't noticeable on the outside. But it was revealed. It was revealed. The true mark of a disciple is not simply hearing and believing. It's believing and doing. That's the true mark of a disciple. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. I think the bedrock, honestly, is obedience. A life built on obedience to God's Word will give you a solid foundation that you can stand on. And when troubles do come, when they do come, because notice the storm came to both the person who was righteous and they built their house on the solid rock and the one who built their house on the sand. Storms come to everybody. And, and really... A house built upon the rock is a life of obedience. And, and that is really, at least from what I find in Scripture, and, and, and if you find something different, I'll be glad to have a conversation with you. But that is the only proof Scripture mentions us being under the Lordship of Jesus, is obedience to His Word. That's, that's what shows that He is Lord. You know, I had a friend used to tell me, you can't say no, Lord. You only have one answer to a Lord. It's yes, Lord, right? So such good truths, right? I mean, just awesome, awesome stuff. Amen. Let's stand together. We ran out of time. Yeah, let's give God a hand clap. Lord, we praise you tonight. We love you. Father, we just give you praise and honor. Thank you for your word, Lord, that guides us each and every day. Lord, as we are looking at the red letters, speak to our hearts as we meditate on them throughout the week. Reveal truth to us, Lord, and may that truth radically transform our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to this message from Christian Ministries Church. If this message impacted you and you'd like to sow into our ministry, you can give at cmchurch.com. If you'd like to listen to more of our messages, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Just search for Christian Ministries. God bless.